Y'all know the old saying, right? Traveling to South Korea, it's, it's good for the soul. What's going on guys? Welcome back to A Sense of Travel. I'm Michael. I'm on a mission on this channel to document all five senses of as many cities, countries, and natural landmarks around the world as I possibly can so that I can immerse you into those experiences alongside me. Now this week we are in Seoul, Korea. This is such a fascinating place. I cannot wait to bring you guys along through all five senses. So let's dive right in. Quite the opposite of cities in South Korea's rather unfortunate northern neighbor, Seoul is the heartbeat of one of the biggest metropolises in the world. Flashy, sophisticated, futuristic, colorful, and blanketed over towering green hills and mountains, Seoul is a megacity with a metro area population of over 26 million and is absolutely drenched in Korea's distinctive identity and culture. In 2023, I had the privilege to travel to Seoul, the furthest I've ever been from home. And the experience was both fascinating and unforgettable. Typical travel vlogs might tell you what to do, where to go, and where you'll get your best Instagram shots. But this isn't that kind of travel vlog. Today, my mission is to immerse you into South Korea's capital city in a way that makes you feel as if you've experienced it right there with me by walking through all five senses that create this electric, hospitable, modern, and yet undeniably Korean megacity. Today, we'll explore the urban heart of Seoul, immerse into the Korean identity through its mesmerizing palaces, temples, and folklore, experience the zen of Seoul's oases, and taste our way through the quintessential dishes of Korea. All right, y'all, let's dive in. It's important for me to emphasize that Seoul is freaking huge. There's no realistic way to capture the entirety of the city in one visit or even a lifetime, and this becomes immediately evident as you approach the skyline of the city. You know, they say that New York City is the concrete jungle, but it doesn't even begin to stack up to the sea of high-rises and skyscrapers that blanket the hilly and mountainous terrain of Seoul. Most people associate skyscrapers with their downtown, but here, virtually any neighborhood could be mistaken for the heart of the city. That said, the actual historic center of Seoul is known as the jongno du district. It's really hard to simplify this singular part of the city because even within it are distinctively different neighborhoods, famous Korean palaces, and gates from varying eras in history, and a truly fascinating blend of tradition and the future. I know I'm not the first person to say this, and this isn't really a novel idea, but it is genuinely incredible that a place like this can exist so close to North Korea. At a first glance, Seoul's downtown seems like what you may come to expect in any huge, dense, urbanized central business district around the world, but with a subtle Korean twist. Huge glass, concrete, and steel skyscrapers tower over the wide, tree-lined boulevards, which smell of damp concrete, pine, auto fumes, and the distinctive scent of ginkgo tree fruits. Ultra-modern and sometimes eclectic designs in the skyscrapers are juxtaposed with ancient Korean city gates and aged, hip and gable dark soil tiled roofs that have become synonymous with Eastern Asian architecture. Away from the wide, modern boulevards, however, is where you really get a tangible sense of where you are in the world. Tight, jumbled, grungy, and seemingly endless alleyways branch away from the glass and steel, decked in flashing, colorful signage in Korean characters, which adorn the hundreds of brightly lit shops. While you'll see a few American chains like Starbucks, Burger King, and Subway on downtown's car-centric strips, it's behind the suits and ties that you'll find an almost entirely localized Seoul experience. By night, the city's alleyways are completely different animals. Imagine every side street in your city kind of looks like Times Square in New York. Well, there you have Seoul at nighttime. 
Neon lights flashing from every storefront, several stories high, fill the hazy air at every turn. Even the broad downtown boulevards become light shows as the skyscrapers glitter, flash, and glow in bursts of fluorescence and neon. To really place yourself imaginatively into the busy, flashing, stimulating alleyways, imagine the hot, muggy, and humid soul air on your skin, which carries the scents of soaps, perfumes, and cooking foods from all over Eastern Asia. As you gaze around at the colors of yellow, red, blue, green, brown, black, and gray, the sounds of K-pop from the storefronts, the bustle and chatter of soul lights, and horns honking in the distance fill your ears. You may even catch the sounds of street karaoke. This one caught me off guard and is pretty fun, typically in super bubblegum Korean sounding music. Above ground, Seoul has all the sounds that you might experience in any megacity. Although, maybe the K-pop is unique on this one. But below ground, Seoul's soundscape becomes surprisingly quiet. That's because on Seoul's metro system, talking is quite frowned upon. While we're on the subject, the Seoul metro system is huge. That anybody can figure this out is beyond me. Dozens of lines crisscrossing over each other in what feels like a spaghetti noodle-like maze can take you practically anywhere in the city, if you can figure it out. Everything in Seoul is written in both Korean and English, which helps a little, but I've gotta say, this is a complex system. Now, getting around Seoul isn't limited to the subway. Buses can also take you practically anywhere. It was in fact on a bus that I had my first conversation with a local. So I like couldn't figure out the bus ticket system. And this really nice lady came up and she was like, no, 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 I'm, I'll pay for you, it's all good. I was like, oh my God, that's like the sweetest thing ever. Total stranger, it was really nice. She even helped me find my Airbnb. This is not the only time in Korea I've experienced strangers being unprovokedly kind, but we'll get to more of that in just a bit. The neighborhoods on the hillsides are where you'll find a soul that isn't defined by ultra-modern skyscrapers and flashing lights. Small, single, or double-story brick structures clotted in big signage and Korean characters alongside brick apartment buildings packed densely into the slopes, doused in a lot of power lines. Interestingly, despite Confucianism, Buddhism, and atheism being the dominant ideologies in Korea, Occasional old stone church buildings and steeples appear above the brick horizon. I'm not quite sure of the history on this, but I imagine colonialism played a pretty large part. Adjacent to the downtown core sits the Insadong neighborhood, which feels like a big market with almost exclusively boutique shops, restaurants, and cafes, filled with locally crafted art, clothes, and food. Here, you'll notice that traditional Korean architecture meets modern international design in the low-rise buildings along the pedestrian promenades, with hip and gable dark soil tiled roofs joining more simplistic, modern, boxy buildings. It's all too common for Westerners such as myself to group Eastern Asia into a monolith of identity. This misconception is the furthest thing from the truth. The Korean Peninsula has developed a strong and unique history and cultural identity that can be tasted, felt, smelled, heard, and, of course, most obviously, seen. In the historic center of Seoul, Korean identity is impossible to miss. Right in the heart of Seoul's jongno do district is the largest of five royal palaces in the city. Now, there are five royal palaces in Seoul. The one right behind me, Gyeongbuk Kung Palace, literally translates to the Palace of Shining Happiness. It's also the largest of the five. I'm really excited to take you inside this place and frankly to take me inside this place. I've really only been to European royal palaces before, so this is gonna be a really cool experience for us both. Let's go take a look. Inside the sprawling palace fortress, which is an absolute maze, are huge cloisters of red wooden beams that are decorated in gorgeous seafoam green art, accented in pastel yet bold colors from across the rainbow. 
The intricate paintings and artwork in the cloisters are incredibly delicate, and the best way I can describe them is zenful. Now the center building right at the center of the palace complex is known as the throne building, um, as it's literally translated. And this is where the head of the dynasty uh, sat and presumably ruled over the lands when this palace was constructed back in 1395. The breathtaking seafoam green artistry from the cloisters almost becomes old news as you gaze into the layered, red wood-beamed, hip and gabled ceiling. At the ceiling center of the cavernous hall sits a gleaming carving of golden dragons. As you imagine yourself in this important physical staple of Korean history and identity, imagine the hot, humid, muggy air filled with the smells of pebbly sand and wood, the sounds of laughing and talking tourists, and footsteps on gravelly stone. As you wander through the wooden passageways, breathtaking surprises like lily pad covered ponds, the royal residence, and old war rooms keep your jaw dropped at every turn of the corner. Speaking of jaw-dropping surprises, right next to the palace in the form of a towering temple is the National Korean Folk Museum. It's absolutely free if you're coming from the palace and immersively dives into Korea's fascinating culture and history. Exhibits walk you through daily life in Korea through all four seasons, and there are even outdoor, open-air exhibits with replicas of houses, known as hanoks, from historic Korea. For such a futuristic and modern city, Seoul does a really awesome job of keeping the medieval Korean roots alive and well. The Nansanggo Hanuk Village is a super charming open-air museum of Korean heritage that replicates a traditional village that could be found here in Seoul and throughout the Korean peninsula. Hanuks, the historic type of home in Korea, have low-lying, traditional hip and gable dark soil tile, which is a reminiscent of terracotta, Asian roofs, and are adorned with facades of white plaster and dark timber built into cloisters and filled with relics and traditional elements of life in an older Korea. In the plaza outside the main gate sits a festive atmosphere with some traditional music and dance, inviting locals in to celebrate their deep musical and dance culture, which is a lot of fun to watch and listen to. In contrast, the village contains several peaceful lily pad ponds surrounded in spindly pines and filled with large, seemingly hungry, fish. As you imagine the scents that fill your nostrils as you peacefully gaze over the ponds, you should imagine pine and aged wood. Jogyesa, a large Buddhist museum and temple, sits nearby in the Insodong neighborhood. Layered in large, ornate, colorful, and intricately carved wooden shrines, the central temple space is marked by gargantuan, gorgeous golden statues of the Buddha, graced by a large stone and dirt plaza which is blanketed in elephant ear plants. Echoing softly through the humid air are the sounds of old Buddhist lyrical music and percussion, and soft footsteps on the sand and gravel. I had a person recently comment that a capital city is best defined by its oases and hidden escapes. In Seoul's case, I think this is spot on. Korean culture really emphasizes balance and peace, or yin and yang. The mind-boggling busyness of the city needs a counterbalance, and one of the best ways to escape is vertically. Towering over the entire metropolis at the peak of the 890-foot-tall Nam Mountain is the Seoul Tower, an additional 915-foot spire that takes you away from the stimulation of the city while simultaneously showcasing the absolute beauty of Seoul's urban and natural landscape. Before the fun, flashy, and kind of Disney World-inspired elevator ride up, the inside of the tower is a bit of a trippy experience. There's a really cool, interactive, and futuristic queue that really showcases Seoul's place as a futuristic city in the global sphere. Then, you reach the top. You don't understand how big the Seoul metro area is until you're on top of the North Seoul Tower. 
because when you glance out over the observation deck, it literally looks like a blanket of fresh snow over dozens and dozens of mountainous hilltops. When I say there are thousands of high rises blanketing the Seoul metro area, I mean thousands. It is genuinely gargantuan. The high rises that blanket the horizon literally go off so far in the distance that you can't tell where it is. And this is by far the biggest metro area I've seen yet. Granted, I haven't been to Tokyo yet, but at this point, this is the biggest, most sprawling skyline of high rises I've ever seen in my life. On clear days, the surrounding mountains are even more majestic, tall, jagged, and mystical. The Seoul Tower isn't the only highlight of Nam Mountain. Namsan Park covers the lush peak side and feels like a jungle within the heart of the city. The hilly, trail-filled park can make you forget that you're anywhere near one of the world's largest metropolises. So inside the park, it's really, really hot, really, really humid, and the air is really, really sticky, but it's so fascinating because you're in the middle of this major metropolitan area, and at the same time you feel like you're in a jungle. And it is really, really cool. And a bit surreal. And you hear all these insect and bird sounds that sound super strange. And it adds that like kind of eerie ambiance of like, where am I? The sounds of birds chirping, some of which sound quite strange, the hum of insects, and the distant sound of cars on asphalt accompany the sense of wet earth and greenery. There's almost a jungle-like quality to the air. It's quite easy to feel lost within Namsan, but there's no reason to fret. There's life and color around every corner. To get back down from Nam Mountain's peak, a lovely cable car with even more vistas is there for the rescue. Seoul's oases can be found not just in the air and on the earth, but in the water as well. On a dusk cruise along the lake-sized Han River, the south side of Seoul electrifies and comes to life. The whitewashed high-rises and skyscrapers blend beautifully into the mountains, gray in the haze, underneath a soft, gray sky. Scents of fishy water, riverboat fuel, and fried foods fill the air and an instrumental soundtrack of Disney tunes keeps the experience grounded in Korean quirkiness. From an East Coast American perspective, Korean food is really just starting to take off in a market that's pretty dominated by Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, and Thai cuisine. That said, I really didn't know what to expect from South Korea's culinary palate, except perhaps Korean barbecue. Here's the thing, Korean food is phenomenal. It's meat heavy, smoky, occasionally sweet, and actually quite healthy. Here are some of the meals and street foods that I experienced in Seoul that really capture the taste of the city. Kimchi Jjigae. Kimchi stew is a classic Korean stew and it's very interestingly prepared. The noodles and broth are placed on a burner right in front of you and cooked, which is quite fascinating. A series of additional stew toppings come prepped on the table right in front of you, and the stew comes with a thick bowl of thick, sticky white rice. The pork is so tender and fresh, and the broth is quite spicy. I can see why this is a Korean favorite. So this young guy sitting next to me saw that I was really struggling with the layout and the setup of the dishes and all that good stuff, and turning on my own burner and all of that. So he walked me through how to my food. And then he realized it was my first time in Korea and bought me a drink. Just a total stranger that was kind of sitting next to me. I mean, Koreans are so nice. What the heck? This would never fly in the United States. We're really mean people. Don't take too much offense to that if you're American. I'm American too. We're mean. Korean barbecue. Served communally, Korean barbecue is more an act than a dish. On a central burner at your table, much like with kimchi stew, delicious, Super thin cuts of beef are placed amidst vegetables like onions and mushrooms to sizzle, and are served alongside sticky white rice and a delicious spread of sauces and veggies. It's a cool and delicious experience that you even get to cook for yourself. 
Korean sticky rice cakes, and herbal tea. Nothing quite gets you through some intense jet lag like sweets and caffeine. Fortunately, Seoul is prepared to handle even the most jet lagged of travelers. Sticky rice cakes taste like your typical rice cake except they're soft and when you dip them in honey, they're perfectly sweet. Pork belly. On a bed of purple-hued rice, I was able to enjoy some truly mouth-watering Korean pork belly. Cut into thin strips, with scissors interestingly, this stuff is the real deal. You'll notice that, in general, meat in Korea is top tier. So Seoul's got a lot of good street food, and one of the traditional ones is called bulmuk. I think I pronounced that right, bulmuk. And they're like fried fish cakes that they serve you in a cup full of broth. Um, it's a really interesting street food and it tastes like fish soup. After the moist and soft fish cake is said and done, the leftover broth makes for a perfect sipping snack as you wander about. It makes you feel all nice and cozy. Barbecue chicken skewers. Another street food that you'll find in corner stands is barbecue chicken skewers. Freshly cooked and of questionable meat quality, these are delicious, moist, and doused in a tangy barbecue sauce. It's all but impossible to capture the Seoul experience in just one visit. I would even venture to say that you could spend an entire lifetime in Seoul and barely scratch the surface. And the thing is, Seoul is changing. The Seoul of today will very likely look completely different in 10 years. But one thing will almost certainly remain. Seoul's place as the epicenter of Korean identity and culture. My hope is that today, by diving in with me through all five senses, you were able to place yourself imaginatively into the flashing, gleaming, mountainous blanket of infinite skyscrapers that is Seoul in a way that makes you feel as if you've been lost in the maze of Jeonbongguk Palace, wandered the jungle-like park atop Nam Mountain, and sipped the broth of Eomuk while perusing the colorful alleyways of Jean Nodu alongside me. As always, thanks for watching. See you next time.